say a big thank you to Ben Chanda for being here with us today. And she's going to share some of these priceless teachings with us. So thank you very much. And uh, now I'm going to hand over, hand over to you. Thank you, Becky and Dee, the co-hosts for today. And uh, thanks to everybody who's here for being here and for being patient as my internet crashed. <laughs> so it's quite interesting, isn't it, when we choose a topic like guarding and quietening the senses, sometimes we actually do quiet them down so much that we disappear. <laughs> so that's the quick and easy way to disappearing, just to drop out of your computer screen. Anyway, I had faith that all would be well and we'd be back on time. So uh, here we are. And it's lovely to see you all. Um, so most of you I actually don't know, many of you I do, and for the ones who I don't know, you might be, I don't know how used to, to uh, hearing the Buddha's teachings you will be. So this is kind of, uh, some of it may be a little bit challenging, um, because it does cut to the heart of things a little bit. We are looking at some of the um, uh, suffering, really, that can be brought about by using the senses in unskillful ways. But of course, the Buddha's teaching always has an incredibly positive message in that there's something we can do to recondition our minds and the ways that we use what we have, right? Because we are in this sense world, and this is to basically most extents our world if we know nothing beyond the five senses. Um, and the Buddha actually went so far as to say um, that the five sense world is our whole world, you know, and the mind as well. Um, and that without reaching the end of the world, he said, there's no making an end of suffering. He said, it's in this fathom long body with its perceptions and mind that I proclaim the world, the origin of the world, the cessation and the way to cessation, the way leading to cessation. A wise one who's reached the world's end is at peace and does not desire this world or the next. So that's actually from the Anguttara of Fours, and it's quite a well-known phrase, I think. And it's important to realize that we can't reach the end of the world by pushing it away. In the Buddha's day, actually, uh, other people from different traditions came to him and said, well, the way we practice sense restraint is we just don't look at things. We just don't hear things. We just uh, don't taste. You know, we, we completely turn away. And he said, that's not the way that I teach cultivation or development of the senses. Um, it's much more nuanced than that because we live in this world and we have to learn to handle it skillfully in a way that can bring around wise understanding and um, a lot of compassion as well. So uh, basically we use the whole practice of the Eightfold Path to accomplish this. But in particular today, I wanted to focus on that aspect of the path, which is called guarding or governing or restraining the senses. And this aligns very closely to the sixth factor of the path, which is right effort or right endeavor. And uh, basically those right endeavors are to bring up the wholesome qualities in our minds and to maintain them, to develop them, to increase them yeah, to fulfillment. And also on the other side, to restrain um, our minds from basically wallowing in unhealthy sense impressions or unhealthy thoughts, uh, you know, things that bring us suffering. So to restrain them from coming in in the first place, and after they have already invaded the mind, which they're bound to do, uh, how to abandon those things, yeah? And it's very interesting in the Eightfold Path and also in what we call the gradual training in the suttas that the sense restraint or the right effort is kind of the link between our virtuous conduct in daily life. So our practice of sila, our practice of virtue regarding the way we speak and our physical actions towards one another and our meditation, which is the mindfulness that we develop on the meditation cushion in the states of still, um, still states of mind called samadhi. So this sense restraint is somewhere in between the two. And in that sense, it can act like a link between the way that we involve ourselves in the world practically and actively and what we do on the meditation cushion. So I think of this as like, you know, you go around in the world during your day, getting busy, maybe getting stressed, hearing bad words, feeling upset, etc. 
And for most people who aren't uh, um, uh, trained in sense restraint or guarding the senses, those kind of sufferings and, and impressions of the day will build up in our mind. So it's a bit like you have this cupboard, your cupboard is your mind, and it's full of stuff. You know, it's full of dirty clothes and it's full of uh, things you've forgotten to iron, things that you haven't really folded up properly. And you open that cupboard when you sit on your meditation cushion and it just all falls out on you in a big heap. <laughs> so you open that cupboard and you think, ah, I don't know where to start. I don't know where my clean clothes are. I don't know which are dirty. Like which ones are useful, which ones are not, which ones I've grown out of long ago because you haven't actually organized your cupboard before sitting down on the cushion. And sensory strain is a little bit like uh, making sure that you keep a tidy mind as best as possible throughout your day, um, basically by cultivating mental virtue. So it's not just the actions of body and speech, but it's our actions of mind, the way we're using our minds to attend. For example, you know, are we looking at the beautiful qualities in a person or are we only focusing on their faults you know how are we attending actually because of usually in fact if not always it's biased you know it's very very partial we don't see the full picture you know um another example like are we looking at ourselves with a critical mind and seeing all the things that we've yet to do and yet to accomplish and the areas where we're weak or are we looking at our strengths you know and giving ourselves some encouragement you know, kind of counting off those little things that we've accomplished and, you know, the way we smiled, even though we were feeling sad or whatever it is, you know, and, and by just learning to attend to those things that can bring gladness really helps to keep the mind in, um, in a good state, you know, where you can be productive in life and you can feel happy about your life. So that when you sit down to meditate, you're not exhausted, trying, you know, having tried to I don't know, beat yourself up or fix the world, right? So this sense restraint, which is a strange word, I prefer kind of guarding of the senses. Guarding the senses is like developing virtue of the mind and inner virtue, the way we look at people, the way we perceive the world and the way we think about that world as well, yeah? So because everything is conditioned, it's possible to mold it in a way that can be to our advantage and benefit. Yeah. So this morning, we're going to be looking at how we can use the mind to kind of condition it in more positive, wholesome ways. And then in the afternoon, we'll look at actually starting to quieten down those senses altogether. Yeah. So equally, because it's conditioned, because there are causes that give rise to the mind and the impressions that we receive at any of the sense doors, we can also let it go. We can also quieten it down. Yeah, Those causes, those conditions are impermanent. So we can let things fade. But before we do that, it's important to know how to handle these things skillfully. So the first uh, thing I wanted to do uh, this morning is to define what these senses really are. Because sometimes it can be confusing. Like, are we talking about the ear? Are we talking about the sounds? Or are we talking about the act of hearing? What is, what does the Buddha really mean by the senses? And there are different aspects of this. So one is the sense organ itself. And that's what the Buddha called the internal sense base, which I think is a bit complicated. So I prefer to think of it as sense organ. And that's the ear, eye, nose, tongue, uh body yeah i nose tongue body and mind yeah and then you have your external sense bases which are forms yeah that you see with the eye sounds that you hear with the ear uh the tastes the smells the touches and the thoughts that come into the mind so these he called the external sense bases things outside of us but these two alone can't really produce any hearing or any sight. So what has to happen is that they come into contact. Yeah? So an, uh, an object of form comes in contact with the eye. And with that contact, there's sense consciousness. So sense consciousness is actually contingent on that contact. And this is a deep point. 
But the main point is that it's not already there waiting in the background. It actually only comes about when there's contact at one of those same spaces. So the form meets the eye, there's contact between the two, and eye consciousness arises. So by eye consciousness, we actually mean seeing, right? Or at the ear sense door, the sound and the ear, the contact of the two, and hearing arises. That's the sense consciousness. And that gives rise to what is subsequently felt at any of these six sense doors. In other words, a feeling arises in response. Yeah, that's called the Vedana. In this case, Vedayita, which means uh, that which has arisen or is to be felt, has been felt. Um, and the feeling that arises due to the contact of any of these sense doors is either pleasant, unpleasant, or somewhere in between. So this is the thing, right? A lot of the time we think we're reacting to things outside. We think we're reacting to unpleasant sights or sounds or smells or physical touches. But actually it's those resultant sensations, those feelings, you know, which may be pleasant or agreeable, which may be unpleasant and extremely disagreeable. It's actually those that we're reacting to. So in this sense, we get a, a sense of what the Buddha meant when he said the whole world lies inside us. Yes, on the one hand, it's outside in the sense that, you know, things do exist outside, but for us, they don't exist until they come in contact with our senses and that consciousness, that awareness arises as a result. And then we feel whatever we feel. So this turns all our attention inside to where the source of these issues lie. And I think this is why the Buddha said, you know, that it doesn't solve the problem simply by not looking. There's a story of Ajahn Chah uh, that my teacher Ajahn Brahm tells. Um, and when he was a young monk, he actually had a lot of lust, a lot of uh, passion. And he would get very sort of, I think sometimes, you know, if people take vows of celibacy, but they're not, they haven't actually seen for themselves the dangers in, in lust and they haven't actually come out of that themselves yet. It can be really quite challenging. And so one uh, rains retreat, he decided to just simply not look at any female that entered the monastery. And he just kept his eyes downcast the whole time. And lo and behold, no lust arose in his mind, which is kind of a miracle. Maybe he wasn't really thinking very much because most of the time it manifests as thought, if not as, uh, you know, a direct kind of projections onto other people. But anyway, he was quite well guarded in that rains retreat and uh, he didn't have any loss. So he thought, oh, wonderful. You know, this is this has been good. And then uh, at the end of the retreat, he raised his eyes and the first person he saw was very average and whoom, all this lost arose <laughs> because he hadn't solved the problem at the root. You know, he was only looking at the object of the senses and, and attributing his internal uh, responses to that rather than working at the root. <clears throat> so the problem can never be solved that way. And this is just an example. It's not to say there's something inherently evil about lust. You know, most of you here are not ordained. You haven't made that choice and that's perfectly fine. You know, it's possible to have wholesome relationships in the world. But we're talking about the kind of responses that causes suffering and that cause the senses to burn. And the Buddha actually said, you know, that these senses are burning. There's a wonderful sutta called the Fire Sermon. It was actually the third sutta that he taught after his enlightenment. And in there, he talks about, you know, the sense organs, the sense objects, the consciousness, you know, that arises as a result, and also the feeling. And he says, all of these, all of them are burning. And he said, there's another translation, actually, for that word burning, which is uh, aditta, or aditta, I think, um, which is to blind or to weigh one down. So he talked about the senses as burning or else blinding us, weighing us down. And then the question was burning with what? And he said burning with greed, with aversion and with delusion or confusion, not really understanding what's going on. Yeah? He also said that they're burning with birth, aging, death, sorrow, lamentation, pain, despair. Yeah. Somebody in my little community today has a birthday 
<laughs> a very wonderful supporter of ours and uh she's a very wise lady apparently she said this morning I wasn't there in the um work meeting but she said uh oh yes it's my birthday today that means I'm another day closer to death I better practice you know and this is really a wise response to that you know not to say oh no you know I'm dying I'm getting old I can't hear very well you know I'm so tired I can barely drag myself out of bed but rather here I am you know life is uh is uh is finite you know <laughs> it's not going to go on forever how can I make best use of my time and in this way the reflection on these things can be very encouraging it can be very motivational and can help us to really make best use of the situation we're in because this body is our vehicle this body and mind is our vehicle for practice and for liberation and uh, and if we use it wisely, understanding the purpose of why we have senses, then we can really get ourselves aligned with the path. So these senses are not meant to be indulged in just simply for the purpose of stimulating some kind of transitory, pleasant feeling that never lasts. You know, the Buddha said there is gratification there. There's certainly pleasure, you know, and there's nothing wrong with, say, enjoying nice food or enjoying a walk in the nature, spending time with those you love. This is actually very important and um, very nourishing for our minds. But it's when we expect those senses to give us something that they simply cannot give us, which is this lasting, sustaining, deep inner contentment and peace that we're really asking for trouble because we're looking for happiness in the wrong place. And this is uh, another lovely quote from Ajahn Chah. He said, it's like searching for the tortoise with the mustache, <laughs> searching for happiness in that realm of the five senses. Um, and even the mind to some extent, but that comes later on, you know, because with the practice, we're starting to find more pleasure in the mind. So it's not that, you know, the Buddha is saying, OK, there's no pleasure out there in the world. He's more saying, yes, there's some pleasure. It's limited. Use your senses carefully. But if you go within, if you go into the mind and you start uncovering the source of your suffering, you know, that is often at that level of reaction to pleasant, pain, painful or neutral sensations, then you can start to find a much deeper, more reliable source of happiness, the happiness of peace. So we're trying to kind of wean ourselves off these inferior types of happiness and get a taste for the more sublime and we'll go into that more in the afternoon but basically he's saying the buddha was saying that real happiness is secluded from the senses it's apart from the sense world and i guess everyone here has some intuition around that because otherwise you wouldn't be meditating you know why would you close your eyes why would you go inside to your mind if you didn't feel there might be a source of happiness there you know, something inside tells us that's a place to be. That's a place where we might find some peace. And, uh, you know, we have to learn to work with what arises, first of all. So because we can't discard or remove those impressions, um, we learn to look at them in a different way so we can change the outcome from something that burns us, you know, like fire. It's called the fire sermon, to something that cools us off and brings about a sense of more happiness in our lives. And the Buddha starts by describing how we do this. So this is from the Majjhima Nikaya, number 51. And this is the section on what is called sense restraint, or guarding the senses. So he says, on seeing a form with the eye, and I'm going to list all the different sense impressions first, so we don't repeat ourselves. Or hearing a sound with the ear, smelling an odor with the nose, tasting a flavor with the tongue, or touching a tangible with the body, or you could say feeling a sensation within the body, or cognizing a mind object with the mind, one does not grasp at the signs and features since if one left the eye, ear, nose, tongue, body or mind unguarded, unwholesome afflictive states of, let's call it lust and aversion, might invade one. So one practices the way of restraint. 
one guards and undertakes restraint of the eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, and mind. Um, so one practices a way of restraint of these faculties. And then he says, practicing this noble restraint of the faculties, one experiences within oneself a bliss that is unsolid. So you see, he's actually trying to restrain the inferior um, sources of happiness to give us a sense of something a little bit superior, a little bit more reliable. And here he's using the word unsolid, which is very beautiful and uh, relates to my own experience sometimes in retreat, where um, you know I was starting to get into my meditation and I was starting to enjoy the happiness that was just coming up in the mind. And because habits are habits, I thought, okay, uh, you know, every day it's nice to go on a walk and see something beautiful. Let's go out and look at the little pond outside. And I went outside and looked at this pond. And the first thing I noticed was it was much more beautiful than usual because I was seeing so much more in it. It was really gleaming with a sort of deep emerald hue, even though it's actually just a muddy dam, nothing very beautiful. But it was so kind of um, satiating in a way that I didn't need to look at it for very long. And actually, I realized that the longer I looked at it, the more I was getting drawn outside away from the happiness in the mind. And then also I ate a, a piece of chocolate because, you know, as a monastic after 12 o'clock in uh, the afternoon, we can have chocolate for some strange reason. <laughs> so I took a little piece of black chocolate just because, you know, I thought that's what I'm used to doing and put it on my tongue and it really felt like turning something on that didn't need to be turned on you know this taste sense door and again it took me away from that happiness in the mind and I realized it was just kind of coarse in comparison and not really worth bothering about to be honest and this wasn't kind of a moral judgment oh I shouldn't eat chocolate or enjoy my food it was just that the mind was already satisfied inside and so I stopped eating that chocolate and just went back inside and sat on my cushion again. And that gave me a sense of what it means by unsolid. Sometimes it's called unblemished bliss. Uh, because sometimes the sense doors or the sense impressions, like the feeling that we get that arises as a result of the senses, is actually quite coarse. And um, yeah, nothing very exciting, to be honest. I'm sure many of you have had experiences on retreat where you've been fantasizing about what you're going to do afterwards and maybe having a nice big piece of chocolate cake or something. And then you come to the point where there it is. And it's like, yeah, OK, you chew it. It's a bit like kind of bread, bready and sort of a bit, you know, rough on the tongue. And it's really, really sweet. And there's nothing that much there. You know, It's just we've built this impression of chocolate cake and we think it's going to It'd be so satisfying to us. But after meditation, it doesn't really have the same hit, you know, and that's not a bad thing. It's not like, oh, no, I don't enjoy the world anymore. It's just I'm OK without it. I'm quite content you know, to sit on my cushion and just eat some food that's really healthy when it's time to eat. So anyway, this uh, this sense restraint is, again, coming at the point in the practice between um already having some happiness from living a virtuous life and preparing the mind for mindfulness to sit down on our cushion and really establish the mindfulness in the mind so i like this idea of one does not grasp at the signs and features so to me what this means is um and it may mean different things to you you know it's uh it's always important to analyze these things and find your own meaning but uh Ajahn Brahm also uses the words, one does not get sucked in to the signs and features. So in a way, we just start to notice, OK, this is hearing or this is smelling, this is sight, this is seeing, rather than, oh, this is beautiful, you know. Oh, I went down to the kitchen and the floor was so well polished and all the surfaces were clean and shiny. It's so wonderful. Instead, we just see, oh, this is seeing, you know, and at this moment, it's bringing a pleasant sensation. Or you go down sometimes into the kitchen and there's food on the floor and you think, oh, why hasn't somebody swept it or whatever? Sometimes I have those thoughts <laughs> being in the monastery. And, uh, 
And then a less pleasant sensation arises. But instead of getting sucked into that, you know, we can just go in and not kind of focus on the dirt on the floor, right? We don't have to focus on those things that bring about a feeling of dis-ease or irritation. We can just see something else instead, like all the food's been put away and, you know, people are quiet and meditating now. And we can look in a different way so that we don't get kind of... Um, irritated by those little things we see so one of the examples that's often used in the suttas is of course of this lust that can come up especially for monastics and not so much I feel in female communities um, but that's a generalization and that's kind of by the by but uh, you know sometimes things do arise and and it's not the appropriate context for that and so the Buddha says look at the ugly part look at the parts that are Kind of nothing to get obsessed about you know for example you know the fact that everybody ages or even with the most beautiful of people you know they have the beautiful physique or whatever recognizing that yeah you look at them from another angle and actually they don't look so attractive <laughs> or maybe you notice that person and instead of seeing them as an object of passion or uh, sexual interest you just see, oh, this person's just like my sister or like my brother, you know, or maybe they're older than me. They remind me of an uncle. Um, we just basically tune into our common humanity instead, rather than objectifying other people. And this can really help to cool the mind. There's some really nice similes for how to overcome um, feelings of anger that might arise in relation to others. <coughs> and as many of you can probably imagine, um, Loving kindness is one of the obvious and most powerful antidotes to that. But the Buddha also says that um, it's like, he gives this very nice simile of walking down the street. And this is in ancient India when people would look out for a bit of cloth to make their robes. Even now I have this robe. It's supposed to be made of rags. So instead of actually getting rags, we sort of cut it up into small pieces, then stitch it back together again. <laughs> sort of in the spirit of that tradition so that we have like not a beautiful fine piece of cloth but just a piece of cloth that's been put together so in ancient India there's a simile um, where somebody walks along the street and they see this really ragged piece of cloth really dirty and not very promising but they think about whether they can make you know use it to make a robe so what they do instead of discarding the thing completely they notice that on that cloth, there's also some bits of fabric that are okay, that are quite strong and not threadbare. And that if they can use their feet, they don't need to touch this thing, but they can use their feet to rip off the good part, they can pick it up and make use of it. And in the same way, the Buddha says, if there's somebody in your life who has perhaps very unskillful speech, maybe they speak very harshly, very coarsely, you know, they criticize others, they swear, they get irritated and exasperated and express it through speech. Then look at the other part of the person. That's like the dirty part of the rag. But what about their physical conduct? Maybe they're actually doing things that are really fine, that are really helpful. And this came to mind, like reflecting on one of my jobs in the distant past, um, where I was working with someone in a nursing home and as a carer. And uh, she used to swear all night. Oh, <clears throat> the person's done this again. Like, we've got to clean the bed. It's <clears throat> soiled, you know. <laughs> but then her actual attitude was one of deep care and nurture for these people. And she would tell me, you know, that she could have got a better job, better paid, much less kind of dirty and sometimes demeaning. Um, but she wanted to do this because who else was going to look after these people? And she really cared. That's why she would swear, you know, she wanted to go in and get them clean as fast as she could. And she would just not bat an eyelid, you know, at the state of a person's cleanliness or whatever. Um, she was absolutely brilliant and so committed to the job. So I started to look at that part of her and realized that this person's a really good person. And she would even ask me questions about my meditation and my life in India and this kind of thing. So I realized, yeah, if you judge somebody too quickly, you actually lose out on seeing the qualities and the things you can learn from that person, because surely she lasted in that job much longer than me, you know. <clears throat> and uh, in a similar way, there might be people who uh, speak very beautifully, you know, 
we all know about people who uh, are great uh, promoters or kind of give a really good uh, CV, but then their actual behavior could be quite manipulative or could be quite exploitative in some ways. So, you know, we can uh, actually focus on the other part of the person. Obviously, you don't want to get sucked in um, in a negative way to be exploited or manipulated or manipulated by a person. But um, sometimes, yeah, they may be unskillful in their actions and their actions of body. But perhaps they do say kind things to others. Perhaps they do kind of keep a level of harmony between the community or in the workplace or whatever it may be. So the main point being, there's always something to look at that can bring us inspiration, happiness, or at least um, pacify the anger or irritation that might arise in us when we get into the fault finding mind. <laughs> yeah. So there's always a way that we can reprogram our mind. And some people say, well, you know, isn't this just really superficial? Isn't this just kind of amending the kind of twigs and the branches without getting to the roots? But um, I think it's more just a way to, to live in the world with the minimal collateral damage to your mind. Because the fact is, as long as we're not free from hindrances, you know, as long as we're not free from anger and lust and wanting, craving, desire, irritation, restlessness, etc., we're not seeing things as they really are anyway. We're only seeing a very partial picture. So why don't we train our minds or mold our minds to see things in a way that gives rise to more happiness, you know? Hopefully we're not masochists here and we want to live a happy life. So why can't we use the fact that our minds are conditioned and perception is conditioned in a way that serves us best, in a way that's for our benefit and the benefit of all those who have to live with us and all those around us? Because honestly, our fabrications of others are just that. They're fantasies, they're myths. There's this wonderful quote I found recently and it's kind of scary in a way, but it says, you know, how painful it is to live only in other people's imaginations. Like how painful it is for that person who maybe is trying to project a certain image so that they can exist in another person's imagination just the way they wish. Because you can't control the way another person sees you, right? And similarly, how painful is it for us when people only exist in our imagination? We create these kind of solid people out of fleeting impressions of others. <laughs> and then we imagine them to be something that they're not. And by doing that, we really fix them in. We box them in so that they can't show us another side. You know, we just kind of blank out all those sides that are against um, our own kind of decision that we've made on that person. We blank out any evidence to the contrary because we want to be right. And our hearts become very closed, right? And the, the tragedy really is that we do it to ourselves, you know, through self-criticism. Somebody came to uh, offer food to the monastic community where I am recently. And uh, they were saying, you know, that they, uh, they go to work and sometimes they look around them and they think, why am I employed here? Everyone else is so much more skillful. They have so much more talents than me. They're much better managers. They're much... Um, more competent than I am you know I'm not able to do those things that they can do and the first thing I said to them was well you're not able to do that yet right because there's no such thing as a fixed person or a fixed ability or competency you know we're all growing and we're growing in different ways at different speeds and also he started talking about how People tell him how kind he is and how lovely it is to work with him. And I said, well, look at that. That's your strength, you know. If people are actually saying that, then you're bringing a great deal of joy to the office where you work. You know, you're a really wonderful, sensitive colleague to have, somebody that people can trust and rely on. And, and why not take that and look at that part of yourself? You know, so work to your strengths and don't always focus on the parts that are weak. But look at the things that you bring to your workplace or family or whatever it is. You can't be good at everything. That's a big ducker for me in my life at the moment because I have to run a monastery and I have to be good, supposedly, 
at management, at websites, at newsletters, at technology, which I've got no background in at all. And I've got to be good at meditation, at teaching, at <laughs> mentoring, counseling, keeping things in a nice atmosphere. My goodness. And can one person ever do all that? You know, there's bound to be areas that you're stronger and areas that you're weaker. Even if you're good at everything, you can't actually do it all in one day, right? So, wow, what a lot of pressure we put on ourselves to kind of, yeah, cover every area to the best of our ability and to be so over-conscientious that we actually drive ourselves and probably else, everyone else a little bit mad. So we start to focus on our strengths. And we can praise those things in ourselves, you know, we can actually um, look at those things, not in a sense of uh, I'm so great, but in a way that encourages the mind. There's been plenty of research to show that encouragement rather than criticism and punishment is the best way to motivate, say, children in a class, you know, and we're the same, we're children in a class, we've all come to the meditation class and we're all just kids, aren't we, messing around trying to get it right. Like sometimes we manage to get into a wholesome state of mind. Sometimes we slip off into irritation or boredom or we just fall asleep. We're just trying. We're just training ourselves. We're not actually there yet. And that's okay. You know, another example, I think mean, there's many examples we can give to like, you know, learning to look at the positive aspects in, in a person or in a situation, just learning to shift our perception a little bit is that uh, after, I think it was last week, I was teaching for London Insight in, uh, in King Alfred's school in uh, Golders Green. And very kindly, they put me up in this hotel but the night before. And it was uh, a very curious little place, a bit like Faulty Towers, but in a good way, because it was actually very comfortable. But anyway, it was very funny. <laughs> My fellow non-friend who's here from Perth was just trying not to giggle when the, uh, the owner of the hotel came out. <laughs> it was really funny. It was just like faulty towers for those who are old enough, which actually shouldn't include myself. Anyway, and uh, I went upstairs and the room was very nice, but it was really hot. And uh, I think I went to bed about 10 at night and tried to sleep. And by two in the morning, I realized I'd just drifted in and out of sleep once or twice. And from then on, I just couldn't sleep at all. So from two to like, I don't know, seven. <laughs> and then breakfast wasn't served till about half past eight. I was just kind of lying there and I realized, gosh, you know, I've got a day retreat to teach tomorrow. Uh oh. And I thought, if I go down that train of thought, it's going to be a disaster. It's happened before. I haven't slept the night before teaching. And it's been fine because really, you know, it's nothing to do with the state of your body. It's just the more the love that you bring, you know, and the fact that you give your best, right? What people get from that is up to them. It's not all on me. This is a dialogue. This is not a monologue, even though it's only me talking at the moment. Um, it's actually a, a community. Like, like Jackie said at the beginning, we're building a sense of community together. So it's not all on one person and whether they've slept. So instead of looking at the fact I was awake, instead I focused on how comfy the bed was. And oh, how nice that I'm awake and I can enjoy the bed. I can just lie here on these nice white cotton sheets and feel hot, but so comfortable. And this is a kind of sense restraint. It's not grasping at the signs and features that are going to drive you mad, <laughs> but it's looking at different signs and features or just looking at the fact that I've got a bed to sleep in tonight. How fortunate, right? How many people in that same city at the same time as me are actually on the street, you know? How many of them are not going to get a breakfast, even if it comes a couple of hours late? They're not going to get one at all. And this isn't to be guilty, right? Because feeling guilty is going to suck my energy as well. And then I can't help other people. But it's just to see that what I have is something, you know, that's a privilege. And if I can reflect on that and develop a sense of gratitude and joy toward that, I actually have more capacity to help others and to share whatever strengths, whatever fortunes I have, you know, I can make use of that to serve. So we can always look at our lives in this way, even if our jobs don't seem particularly um, virtuous. Actually, I think they are, you know, almost everything you do, it's not so much what it is or how much it helps. It's kind of what you bring to it. 
It's your attitude, your disposition towards others. And obviously that won't always be great, but look at the times it is and look at your intention more than, you know, whether it worked or not, because we can never please other people, you know. And if we're kind of basing our self-worth on what other people think and how other people respond, we're really playing around in worlds that we don't belong in because that's their responsibility. And ours is to look at the way we react to the things going on inside. So that's the example of sleeplessness, but um, I wanted to just give one more, which is a little bit of a distressing example, but I think it's so important, especially because I know in these communities, there are, there's a lot of people who are involved in activism and um, really trying to bring about changes at a bigger, more systemic level in this world, which is absolutely laudable and a very selfless and courageous thing to do but it takes so much energy and resource. And a lot of the time, you know, people get burned out. In my role too, I mean, I've had a serious burnout a couple of years ago that I'm not fully recovered from. Other things now like hormones and goodness knows what physiological things are going on. Um, and it's so difficult to be on that edge where you're trying to give, you know, um, but you yourself are getting depleted. And a, a friend told me recently that a young man involved in, um, in climate uh, activism committed suicide because he was just so overwhelmed, I'm guessing. OK, this is speculative, but so overwhelmed by the devastation that he could see that human beings are doing to this planet. Right. And probably a sense of the futility of anything we can do to change that. And this is actually an example of what can happen when we don't have enough sense restraint in the sense that, and I'm not saying it's this person's fault, but in the sense that, you know, we start off with so much positivity and hope. And over time, we start to get quite frustrated and jaded and feeling a sense of helplessness. And often that's due to low energy, not having enough energy and not knowing how to rest and pull back and gladden our mind. So we start to see all the areas that things aren't working rather than, you know, seeing the efforts that we're making. And even if it seems so small, just rejoicing in that. And I think this is so, so important for people that are trying to do big things, that we celebrate the small steps, you know, that we actually take time to recharge and resource and maybe not to always incline our minds to those things, but to take time out just to have fun or to go on a walk in the park and look at the beauty around us, the nature that is intact and that, you know, the spring flowers and blossoms that are coming out right now, that, uh, you know, everything's going according to its natural cycle. Um, the fact that we do have food to eat, the fact that, you know, there are so many people that care. So it's difficult and I can't imagine, you know, what this person was going through, but it's a kind of shocking and stark example, but, something that I think could be helped by, you know, learning to celebrate whatever we can do rather than looking at the vast amount we can't change. Yeah. So these are really, really important attitudes and, uh, and uh, perceptions and ways of using the mind that can help us in our practice and that can give us the um, encouragement and motivation to keep cultivating that goodness because we just usually don't have any idea of the profundity of say a simple act of kindness on somebody else's life you know it's not going to be in the newspaper someone's not going to sort of write in and say you know I was feeling so down today I didn't know whether I could carry on but then someone smiled at me or someone I don't know offered a meta session and it just gave me hope I could carry on this is usually not going to be heard by us but sometimes it is, and this can give great joy and great hope. So, you know, there's little things we can do to um, guard our minds. My teacher, Ajahn Brahm, gives a beautiful simile. He says it's like having a bouncer on the mind. <laughs> You're putting bouncers, you know, like on the nightclubs, you have bouncers to keep the wrong people out and to uh, make sure only good people come in, people who won't cause any trouble. In a similar way, this sense restraint or guarding of the senses is like having a bouncer, you know, at that place where the impressions of the senses come in so when that form meets the eye you know we have someone there to like guard what happens next 
And if it's something that's giving rise to unwholesome states of mind, we don't chuck that person out. You know, the bouncer just notices. And that's usually enough for the person to disappear. So we just notice the impression that the sense doors. And uh, usually this is enough for us to notice whether it's leading to happiness or suffering for us. So I think that's enough for this morning um, to give a little bit of uh, instruction, I guess, and a context for what we're going to be doing. And uh, yeah, I'd like to encourage us to do some meditation now. <laughs>